So, behind me on the, uh, the board, I've got several important ideas. I count, what, one, two, three, four, five um, important ideas in this first section entitled The Problem of Socrates. In this section, Nietzsche begins by um, you, pretty well constructing a fiery ad hominem argument about Socrates here, but even before he does this, right, uh, the important idea, right, the first very important idea that, that comes out of this section is um, that the value of life cannot be estimated, right? Um, what he is responding to is a philosophical position that we've seen to some extent in Plato, right? If um, we're living our lives, right, and we are the kinds of creatures that Plato claims that we are, with a body that has sensations, um, the senses, and sensual desires, right? And a soul that's made up of reason, um, spiritual desire, and the desire for beauty, right? Then, well, what we have is a hierarchy of things, right? What we find in Plato's philosophy is that in all cases, soul is to be preferred to body, right? And what's more, if we look at Plato's metaphysics again as well, right, we've got the realm of the perfect forms or ideas, right? A heavenly realm in which everything that makes truth what it is exists in its purest form, right? There's no change, there's no, no multiplicity, there's no flux. It's an absolutely eternal sort of heavenly realm, right, in which um, the proper nourishment of our souls exists, right? And then, next to this perfect world, right, what we have is the realm of appearances, right? The world you and I are existing in right now, right? Where things come into being, they pass away, there's suffering, um, our sensual desires lead us astray and make us do stupid, foolish, wrong-headed, nasty things, right? But what Nietzsche wants to claim is that right off the bat, what philosophers, right, and he's going to be hitting Plato quite a bit here, right, what philosophers have done is separated, right, into two options, a crappy world in which we exist and a better world in which we want to exist, right? And we've done it with ourselves, too. What we've done is created a conflict, right? There is this divine soul, right, which is rational within us, which is good, right, and we should be concerned with the health of. And then there's our dirty, imperfect body, which should be shunned to the extent that it can, right? In fact, a close read of Plato shows us that it, well, quite frankly, as philosophers, we don't want to be here, we want to be up in this heavenly realm. But how do we get there? We die. Right? We die. Plato actually called the body the prison of the soul in um, the dialogue The Phaedo, which is in your Five Dialogues book. And what's more, he makes a further argument about how a philosopher who really does philosophy properly should not fear death. Why? Because a philosopher in their practice of philosophy is living their entire lives as close as possible to death. Right? So what Nietzsche wants to criticize the whole history of Western philosophy right off the bat with is of being life-denying, of saying that life has no value, right? of having, basically, a death wish implanted right at its very center. Right? So to respond to this, Nietzsche tells us that the value of life cannot be estimated. Right? This is the principle that's going to tie his work together. Right? Now this is an interesting principle insofar as, well, if we really think about it, what's Nietzsche claiming here? The value of life cannot be estimated. Right? Well, is life good or does it suck? Any answer to those questions cannot be true or false. Right? The world is not truly a crappy place. Right? The world is not truly a good place. The world is. It exists. And we judge it 
to be good or bad, worthwhile or problematic. Right? These are judgments, and insofar right, as they're judgments, right, we make them. Right? So they're not true or false. All they reveal is something about our disposition. So Nietzsche's first criticism of Socrates and the whole of the Western tradition in philosophy is that they take value to be something already embedded in the nature, in nature or in truth. Moreover, philosophers tend to conclude that life, of life, that it, ha, it that it's no good. Nietzsche cites Socrates, to live that means to be sick a long time is sort of evidence for this claim. So if we look closely at the, the claim that life is no good, we find at once that it's not the sort of claim that can be true or false, but rather it's a judgment and one that we make about life. That's us. Right? We do it. And Nietzsche takes any judgment that would uh, start off by telling us that life is no good to be a sign of decline Sick, uh, sickness and a, a symptom of degeneration. All right. So, all right. Most uh, Nietzsche claims take uh, take the consensus among the great thinkers who all sort of agree with Plato to be a sign that they're correct. Right. But rather, what Nietzsche wants to argue is that these thinkers more likely concur because they agreed in some sort of psychological or physiological respect. That is, they suffer from the same cultural malady. Right? Now, at this point, what Nietzsche does is he turns to what is the unusual case of Socrates. Right? Socrates, as Nietzsche notes, was a bit of an odd duck. Right? He had these, these sort of strange features, right, uh, by all Greek stan standards. Um, he was a, quite an ugly person, and he was not the projective image of Greek normacy. Right? So, in section 3 of The Problem with Socrates, uh, Nietzsche calls Socrates a low-class, plebe, and ugly. Right? And these judgments, by all accounts, right, are more or less a cultural fact. Right? A matter of historical fact. Right? Um, the interesting remark comes um, in section uh, in section three comes only at the end when Nietzsche cites the case of a foreigner who claimed that Socrates quote harbored in himself all the bad vices and appetites, and Socrates simply responds, "You know me, sir." Right? So this is going to become important uh, just just in a few minutes here. Right. But um, what I want to point out to you about this sort of ad hominem attack, he was an ugly, low-born plebe, um, monstrous face, Nietzsche uh, theorizes that he might be a criminal, right? Um, well, Nietzsche's quite right to point out that, you know, the, the culture that, that prided itself on physical vitality, right, on health, health of the passions, um, the strong erotic um, sort of naturalistic games that Greece has introduced to us, they gave us the Olympics, right? Now, there's Socrates, this ugly, old, plebe, lowest class, barefoot, poor person walking around in, uh, in the Agora in Athens, right? And Socrates, he changed the way that the Western world thought about themselves, right, and thought about thinking, right? How is this possible? Socrates was sticking out like a sore thumb in the Agora, right? He wasn't your normal Greek, right? So why did people take him seriously? Now, Socrates is also sort of weird, and um, in addition to these physical features, Nietzsche notes the, the hypertrophy of the logical fac faculty and that sarcasm of the radic, which distinguishes him. Right? So, as we noted in our read of the Apology, Socrates is extremely sarcastic and hyperlogical. Right? So the question still remains, how did this ugly, unusual, hyper-sarcastic and logical plebe change the Greek and thus the Western taste away from a model that em emphasized the, the physical to one that emphasized the intellectual.